Good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon. This is Dr. Gaius, Bio 112, Anatomy and Physiology 1. And um, this is the um, chapter 9 kind of review, kind of re lecture. So let's go into our modules and then look for. Two, is it, are we in unit two, unit three? Yeah, we're in unit three. Sorry about that. Scroll down, go to your unit three lectures. And we find chapter nine. In chapter nine is muscles. Now, of course, we already uh, reviewed in tissues the difference between skeletal, cardiac, striated. Uh, I mean, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Know which one's striated, of course, skeletal. Which one's controllable or voluntary, skeletal. Which one's not voluntary or involuntary, that's your cardiac and your smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is also known as visceral since it deals with your viscera or your guts, your internal organs. Um, which one's rhythmic? Cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. Remember my story about the stethoscope. I not only put a stethoscope in your, uh, uh, your thoracic region, I also put it in your abdominal region. Cardiac and smooth muscle. Don't need to know the number of muscles, but you need to know that in order for my muscles to work, I of course need a muscle. It's got to be connected to uh, the brain via some nervous tissue, of course, descending fibers, effector fibers, or the effector pathway of homeostasis. And of course, I got to give it oxygen because we're going to find out in a minute that we need ATP. And the only way we know how to get ATP is if I consume glucose in the form of food and oxygen in the form of air. And of course, connective tissues, we already talked about the tendon, which connects um, muscle to bone. And we're going to see that in a minute. So this, need to know these terms. Best way to know these terms, fascia, tendon, aponeurosis, epimesium, paramesium, and endomesium, we can look at this picture. Maybe we'll zoom a little bit. So when we looking when we're looking at this, of course this is my tendon. It's connecting this muscle, this whole muscle, to bone. Now the covering of the whole entire muscle is the muscular fascia. Now the epimesium is the covering right underneath it. The perimesium is covering this whole thing, which uh, is called a fascicle. So the perimesium is covering the fascicle. And within the fascicle, you have uh, muscle fibers, right, which is this broken down. And the endomesium covers the muscle fibers. You also have here the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which we talked about. It uh, stores calcium when we need it and when we don't. And I mean, it releases calcium when we need it and stores it when we don't. And of course, the myofibril, the actual my, uh, myo, muscle fiber, and it has filaments. And uh, we're going to see another picture that's even smaller. So we look here, and of course, you can see here, these are your actin and myosin proteins which help, uh, you know, they pull together to make uh, a contraction. Now, what's a sarcomere? Well, it's, it's what gives the fibers a striated or a striped pattern. Now, you don't need to know what I-band, A-band, light zone, Z-disc. What do you need to know? You need to know that your muscle fiber, also known as your myofibril, is composed of two types of proteins. One is thick, 
and that's your myosin. And the other one is thin, and that's your actin. And a sarcomere is just merely a defined um, region of the myofibril or the muscle fiber from, you know, uh, you know, from one defined area to another. And you could see this is the beginning of uh, one set of um, actin proteins, and this is the beginning of another set. And then the thick myosin is in the middle. And what's its only function? The sarcomere and the muscle itself, its only function is to contract or get smaller and decrease in size. And we're about to show you how to do that. Thick myosin and thin actin. And um, uh, um, there is also these cross bridges, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. The thick and thin filaments act together and they pull on each other, and then uh, when they pull on each other, they pull closer, and hence, uh, you know, uh, contracting or making the muscle shorter. So, this is what they mean by myosin heads. They have these little protein little heads here, and they connect to the thin uh, filament, which is actin. So, you got to use your imagination a little bit that. It hooks onto here and then it pulls this way, and this thing hooks onto here and then pulls this way. So if both sides are pulling, both sides of the myosin uh, uh, start pulling on the actin, then you could see how everything gets shorter. Uh, let's see if uh, we can find a video. This one. So I've got my essay written, and I've been working on it for about a week. So now I'm going to show you how I use Grammarly to edit. Let's just watch this. Muscle contraction is at the basis of all skeletal movements. Skeletal muscles are composed of muscle fibers, which in turn are made of repetitive functional units called sarcomeres. Each sarcomere contains many parallel overlapping thin, actin, and thick myosin filaments. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other, resulting in a shortening of the sarcomere and thus the muscle. This is known as the sliding filament theory. Cross-bridge cycling forms the molecular basis for this sliding movement. Muscle contraction is initiated when muscle fibers are stimulated by a nerve impulse and calcium ions are released. The troponin units on the actin myofilaments are bound by calcium ions. The binding displaces tropomyosin along the myofilaments, which in turn exposes the myosin binding sites. At this stage, the head of each myosin unit is bound to an ADP and a phosphate molecule remaining from the previous muscular contraction. The myosin heads release these phosphates and bind to the actin myofilaments via the newly exposed myosin binding sites. The two myofilaments glide past one another, propelled by a headfirst movement of the myosin units powered by the chemical energy stored in their heads. So what do we need to know? You need to know that myosin requires ATP. You need ATP to have the energy for these myosin heads to pull on this actin. And you can see here, calcium acts as an initiator to open up the binding sites. So um, we're going to talk a little bit more about detail, but what kind of question could I ask? I could ask muscle contraction, does it require ATP? Does it require energy? And the answer is yes. Does it require calcium? And the answer is yes. Okay. Now we didn't mention any other things, so think calcium and ATP requirement for muscle contraction. And you can see here if this the sliding filament theory, like if you start sliding the filament over, right, then everything gets closer, everything starts contracting, and the muscle will get smaller. And the sarcomere, which is just the defined area of, you know, of the actin filament, that also gets smaller as well. The units move, they release the ADP molecules bound to their heads. 
The gliding motion is halted when ATP molecules bind to the myosin heads, thus severing the bonds between myosin and actin. The ATP molecules are now decomposed into ADP and phosphate, with the energy released by this reaction stored in the myosin heads, ready to be used in the next cycle of movement. The myosin heads resume their starting positions along the actin myofilament and can now begin a new sequence of actin binding. The presence of further calcium ions will trigger a new cycle. And you can see here ATP is utilized not for the current contraction, but for the next one. And you see everything gets pulled over and gets closer. Therefore, the, um, the muscle, first at the, at the microscopic level, the sarcomere will get smaller. And if all the sarcomeres get smaller, then the whole uh, entire length of, um, um, of the muscle will get smaller. Okay? So... We need chemical components, and what are they? ATP, and I also need calcium. Now, how does the nerve get into play? We discussed at the beginning of this lecture that you require, it, like this, all this movement requires a brain, requires a nerve. Now, the nerve sends electrical impulses. That electrical impulse is called an AP, or action potential. Now. Um, let's look at a picture, it's better, let's look at this picture. So the electricity comes down through this motor neuron. Neuron is nerve cell, and you can see it's colored yellow. In real life it isn't really yellow, it's kind of like a, a really light yellowish, whitish color. So it goes down here, the electricity, and when the electricity gets to the ends of the neuron or nerve cell, in this synaptic bulb, and that's what it's called, it's going to uh, release um, uh, like uh, vesicles. And remember, vesicles got packaged by the Golgi, and you can see here mitochondria because we need energy for this process. So these vesicles release neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemicals, and the classic example in a um, in a in this whole thing, which is a motor unit. It's like, you know, brain, nerve, muscle. Acetylcholine is the um, neurotransmitter. So it goes from electricity to chemical, acetylcholine, and then back to electricity. And that's what uh, the acetylcholine then signals, uh, you know, uh, ATP and calcium, hey, it's time to contract this muscle. Now, remember we talked about in class that, um, uh, what do you call that? That's how drugs work, if you look at here. So if I was going to give like a muscle relaxant, don't you think it would be something that would block acetylcholine so my muscles can't contract very well? And I could do that with a whole bunch of things. We already know about ATP. We already know about uh, th that it's required. We already know that the thick, um, uh, um, what do you call fibers or, or, or protein or thick filaments, that's uh, myosin, and the thin ones are actin. Now, what happens to the acetylcholine when I already use it? Well, of course, I have an enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, that'll decompose it so we can keep it for later. Same thing with the calcium. I recycle it. After I, I use up the calcium, any excess or any calcium that I need to use for the next time will be in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that was that web-like um, um, structure that surrounded um, the muscle fibers. And troponin, tropomyosin, those are other proteins and they're on actin. Nice to know, not crucial. We, slide, we mentioned this in uh, creatine, why all these people in the gym love eating creatine powder. And you could see here 
um, uh, uh, creatine um, promotes, as you can see here, um, uh, uh, um, um, phosphorylization, and we now because and we now know right that phosphorylization builds ATP, and we saw that in electron transport chain. So when your ATP is down, you take creatinine, and what will it do? It'll convert ADP to ATP. But again, what's the best way to get ATP? Not by drinking all those powders that has creatine in it and protein powders. Best is to do what? Eat balanced diet, eat well, sleep well, follow the rules of the body. All right, phases of cellular respiration. For, for now, all we need to know is that those, um, don't look at this because this will confuse you. Remember, aerobic were the three things that we were talking about because they all require oxygen. So the citric acid uh, cycle, electron transport chain, and glycolysis. And we already know that the electron transport chain utilizes um, um, oxidative phosphorylation to make a ton of ATP. Now, if I need to store some oxygen for future use, I have this protein called myoglobin. And myoglobin, globin, protein, myo muscle, that, um, that particular uh, protein stores any uh, extra oxygen I need for my muscles. But what happens when I can't contract the muscle? It's either I don't have enough blood, and we know that carries oxygen, I need that. If I don't have enough uh, ions, specifically calcium, I won't, I'll, I'll have some weakness. And of course the brain. Uh, remember I mentioned um, like long distance running of like uh, 10 kilometers or more? That's when you're, that's when the majority of the exercise becomes mental. Um, so remember, the brain uh, has to be connected to a nerve and then has to be connected to the muscle. And then, last but not least, um, lactic acid. That is, accumulates if, you know, uh, if you're working out too hard and you're not, um, your body isn't um, taking in oxygen. Because we already know that acid, specifically lactic acid, is a byproduct of um, oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transfer chain. Muscle cramps, again, we mentioned it, electrolyte concentrations, and uh, remember my Gatorade story, so always hydrate. I'm hydrating right now. Got my little water next to me at all times. What happens when we shiver? Well, because just like when we do any uh, exercise, if you do any exercise or, you know, you start, you, heat is a byproduct, byproduct of this because of all the uh, chemical reactions required for you to move muscle. And that's why when you get cold, you shiver. Muscle tone. We mentioned this in lab. That's the continuous state of partial contraction in a resting muscle. So how do I know I have muscle tone? Well, you can feel it in your, in your, uh, you know, in your skeletal muscles when, you know, uh, when you squeeze your arm or, or, or you know, uh, squeeze a muscle. And remember my example: if I bonk you in the head with a hammer and, and you you pass out, right? What will happen? Will you still be standing? Will you still be sitting in that position? No, because in order for you to sit and or stand or in any position, you, there is a con there's a, some level of tone and a continuous state of partial contraction in the resting muscle. Now let's look at this one and let's, let's, let's break this one down because I had a, a couple of questions uh, regarding this. You have three types of contraction, concentric, eccentric, and isometric. So concentric, think it goes, uh, Think of what? Con means with. So it's going with the movement. That means you're working with me, right? I can lift this thing. But what if I can't lift this thing, right? If this weight is too heavy,
don't you think it'll stretch the, the length of the muscle much longer than its normal length? This is its normal length over here, but you see this, as it's all stretched out? That's eccentric. That means uh, I don't have enough force to lift this object, and that's why this object won't go past my elbow because it's heavy and gravity is pulling it down. So that's eccentric. And last but not least, isometric. That's when you just flex and you're going nowhere. But the, the muscle stays the same length, hence the term iso. Iso means the same. So how can I ask this question? Um, Johnny uh, lifted up a lightweight and uh, uh, he was easily, he could easily flex his muscle when he picked up the 10 pounds. That's called concentric contraction. What happens in concentric contraction? The muscle uh, length gets shorter, and that's flexion for in this particular case. Now, what happens if I tell you Johnny cannot lift this, uh, uh, this weight? He tried to be a little bit arrogant and tried to pick up an 85-pound dumbbell, and now what's he doing? He can't lift it past his elbow, and the, his muscles are lengthening because he just can't muster the strength of it and it the gravity is pulling it down last but not least Johnny wants to uh, you know um, he's not lifting any weight and he's keeping his arm still but he's giving himself a little contraction muscle contraction but you know his muscles don't aren't changing in size they are staying the same hence the term isometric and that's this so this is a nice one, isn't it? Very testable. Smooth muscle, we already know. And smooth muscles are smooth because they don't have striations in their myofibrils. You have multi-unit, visceral smooth, nice to know, but think visceral, think I can't control it, think um, lining of the wall of all, all, almost all of my hollow organs, especially my, my gastrointestinal tract. The example that we used is our esophagus, or food tube, and peristalsis. Um, again, calcium ATP, it's universal. But the, the different thing about smooth muscle, visceral muscle, is that Skeletal muscle only requires the, neuro, the single neurotransmitter acetylcholine, but um, uh, smooth muscle requires acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Okay, acetylcholine is, uh, I don't know, I remember it as capital A, capital C, and lowercase h, but hey, you know what it is now, acetylcholine, and norepi, norepinephrine, N-E. Now, the cool thing about cardiac muscle is, remember we talked about like gap junctions and, 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 and desmosomes uh, briefly? Well, the cool thing about cardiac muscle is they form something called the syncytium. That means, let's say you got one cell, cell A, um, beating at um, 60 beats per minute. And then you have cell B beating at 70 beats per minute. Well, when you put them together, they're gonna find a middle ground and like beat it like 60, 60, 65 beats per minute, like together. Let's see if we're, uh, better way, maybe there's a, a video to show syncytium. But sin means the same. Let's look at this. I have to stop and tell you guys about Lecturio. L-E-C-T-U. Cardiac muscle. The cardiac muscle is located only in the heart. Anatomy. They are made up of striated uninuclear cells joined end to end forming a network. Cell junctions are called intercalated discs. That's important. The cardiac muscle has gap junctions. The arrangement of actin and myosin is not as organized as the skeletal muscle. It contains sarcoplasmic reticula, transverse tubules, and numerous mitochondria. 
The sarcoplasmic reticulum is less developed than the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the skeletal muscle and stores much less calcium. Physiology of the cardiac muscle. It consists of... Now you know why there are these things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, T-tubules. Because I, uh, they, uh, she just mentioned that it's not as efficient as uh, skeletal muscle, right? Like cardiac muscle isn't, you know, isn't benching, uh, you know, 210, right? Uh, the contractions are very small, but it needs calcium nevertheless. And these are the T tubules here. Exciting tissue. It has rhythmic contractions, 60 to 100 beats per minute. It is involuntary and has all or nothing contractions. It pumps blood to lungs for oxygenation and to the body for distribution of oxygen and nutrients. Excitation contraction coupling of the cardiac muscle. The action potential spreads out through the cells and across the surface of the sarcolemma via gap junctions. Voltage gated calcium channels are present in the sarcolemma that get activated Calcium diffuses into the intracellular fluid from the extracellular fluid. The free calcium present intracellularly activates voltage-gated calcium channels of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium diffuses from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the myoplasm. The calcium that diffuses into the cell and the calcium that diffuses through the calcium release channels attach to troponin and initiate contraction. All right, they kind of saw, they kind of showed you syncytium. See here, you put two cardiac cells together, it forms a gap junction. And then things go in and out freely. And one of those things are, is calcium. So when you put, let's say this cell is running at 60 beats per minute, this cell is running at 80. You put them together, they're going to communicate, and then they're going to find a middle ground like 70. And that's what a sensation is. And also you got a nice little video on how exactly does your calcium move in and out of your, um, in and out of your cells. Okay? And they don't have uh, tetanic contractions. They can't. You're, 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 Excuse me. Your heart cannot um, cannot go into tetany because if it does, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Okay. Now, uh, nice to know, full chrome lever, uh, but uh, we kind of discussed this a little bit in lab. What's more important? Do you know that this is your bicep break eye? This is your tricep break eye. Your bicep break eye is the agonist. The tricep break eye is the antagonist. And we mentioned now there's um, your brachial radialis is an extra muscle over here that helps the bicep during contraction or flexion here, right? And uh, that is considered a uh, synergist muscle to your bicep. And this is the exact opposite. When you have, look, he's doing a tricep pull down in the gym. Um, so when you do the opposite, if I'm doing extension, right, or tricep extensions, how's that? The tricep is contracting, but your bicep is relaxing. Remember, they go together and you can't have contraction on both sides or your, your, your muscle will seize up. You won't be able, you won't be able to move. We already know uh, the terms origin versus insertion. Which one's less movable? Of course, the origin. Which one's more movable in the insertion part? Which one's more prone to injury? The insertion part. Here's an example of um, origin insertion. The more proximal end of the bicep we already saw in class doesn't move too much. So um, um, bicep has to connect into two places of its origin. So you have the coracoid process and also, um, uh, I 
can't remember my origin insertions anymore, but you can see here there's a second part and it looks like the eh, spine of the scapula. Eh. Again, you're not responsible for that, but if I showed you this picture, which one would you say is m not moving too much? This side. Which one moves a lot? This side. And now you can see the insertion of your biceps brachii is your uh, radius. So if I break my radius, right, or uh, this tendon right here, can I flex my arm? No, I cannot. Agonist, prime mover, synergist, we already went over that. Now let's look at this. This is now, uh, this is more for laboratory, but could I ask, um, like, um, which is the muscle on your forehead? You'll tell me frontalis. Which is the circular muscles on your eyes? Your orbicularis oculi. Which is the uh, muscle on your cheek? Zygomaticus. Which is one of the muscles of mastication? Masseter. What's the muscle, uh, circular muscle, uh, around my lips that helps me whistle? Orbicularis oris. Here's the uh, anterior view of my traps or trapezius, but they're better seen in um, the posterior view. Of course, this is my deltoid, pectoralis major, linea alba of my abdomen, rectus, one of the six pack or eight pack, if, if you really, really um, have no body fat, right? And then you have your external oblique, your serratus anterior, biceps brachii. And look at these two synergist muscles that help my biceps brachii upon uh, flexion. That's your brachialis and your brachioradialis. Oh, do, 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 do. Tensor fascia latae is um, that uh, fascia uh, connected tissue on the um, lateral aspect of your thigh. Um, bu, 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 bu. Sartorius rectus femoris, adductor longus, and that makes sense because it's the long muscle here on the inside, and you have your vastus lateralis here. And of course, if I have a vastus lateralis, I also have to have a vastus medialis. Your vastus mu muscles are part of your quadriceps, which is the four major muscles in your thigh. So I could ask you, where are your quadriceps? You'll tell me in your thigh. How many parts to the quadriceps? Four. How many parts to the bicep? Two. How many parts to the tricep? Three. Of course, here's your patella. Gastric nemius, which is better seen in the back. Tibialis anterior. Soleus, nice to know. Now, regarding extensor and flexor, remember what I stated in uh, laboratory, how I figure out which one's which. But this is a beautiful identification for future lab Hint, hint. Don't you think I could ask you on the automage table, identify any of these? Hint, hint. Yes. Now, on the automage table, you had your ox uh, uh, occipital temporalis, which stretches from your occiput or your occipital bone back here all the way to the front. Here are your trapezius, and you could use your imagination in a little bit. It's kind of like a pyramid that got its chop that, that got its like top chopped off, and that's a trapezoid, if you don't recall. This is what a trapezoid looks like. It looks like a pyramid with, that, with, with uh, the top cut off. So you kind of use your imagination here. One side, another side. This is a side, that's a side. And those are your traps. Terrace minor, major, right? All these inside muscles, infraspinatus, we already know that's part and parcel of your sits. Your supraspinatus, infraspinatus, terrace minor, and uh, what's S? Subscapularis, right? Um, nice to know, won't ask an exam, but what's better? Trapezius, definitely. Deltoid, definitely. Triceps, definitely. Anything on the, the dorsal side of my uh, body are extensors here in our forearm. You have your gluteus maximus, gluteus medius. If I'm gonna ask about your external oblique, I'll ask it in the anterior. Here's your uh, lateral, I mean lateral, latissimus dorsi. 
something has a lot of latitude, that means it's wide, or you have a wide berth of what you can do and what you can't do. Remember latitude and longitude on maps, if you remember third grade map reading? Was it third grade or fifth grade? I don't know. One of the many useless topics um, in grade school. It's good that now we're in college and we're having useful topics. Here's your bicep femoris, helps flex your, uh, um, your thigh. Semitendinosus, semimembranosus, nice to know. Gracilis, nice to know. Here's another view of your vastus lateralis. Now, this big uh, calf muscle, that's your gastrocnemius, okay? And it connects to your uh, calcaneal tendon, also known as your Achilles. Okay, because remember, the Achilles heel. This is your calcaneus, it uh, extends in here, the tendon, then connects directly into your gastrocnemius. So these two are golden, not only, uh, more for lab and automage, but can I ask you, uh, what's the triangle-shaped muscle? You'll tell me, deltoid. What is the big, wide muscle on your back? Latissimus dorsi. What's your butt or your buttocks? That's the best way to uh, say that term. That's your gluteus maximus. What, it goes, what is the muscle that has two heads or two bellies in the back of your thigh? And that's your bicep femoris. What's the big uh, calf muscle in the posterior section of your, uh, you know, um, of your lower leg? And you'll tell me gastrocnemius. See, so I could still ask it without a picture. But remember, pictures are more for labs. Here's other pictures that are uh, also good for labs. But I could ask, what's, the, uh, what's that muscle on the side of my head above my ear? You'll tell me temporalis, right? You have masseter. You have your platysma here. That's the big flat muscle. This is your sternocleidomastoid. That is the muscle that connects to your sternum, clavicle, and the mastoid process of your skull right here. And buccinator, again, muscles of mas mastication, right? But these other ones, nice to know. Now, your, your posterior strap muscles, you know what? I'm going to call it right now. No, don't look at this. OK? It's too deep, uh, too specific. Another view of your deltoid, latissimus dorsi, and trapezius. This is the superficial side. And here's the more um, um, uh, um, Internal. This is a little superficial, this is a little bit more deep. So I could ask you what a levator scapulae will do to your shoulder blade. Of course, it'll lift it up. And here's your uh, rotator cuff muscles. Must know trapezius, must know deltoid. Your scalenus, nice to know. Rhomboid, nice to know. Trapezius again, deltoid, right? Your pec major, okay? Now, you also have internal intercostal. So, an external intercostal. So if I ask you, where are your internal or external intercostals? You already know your medical terminology powers, al, pertaining to cost. Cost means ribs. So your costals, internal and external, they're where? On your ribs. We already have erectus and dominus, we already have no oblique. What if I ask you, what is the set of abdominal muscles that run across your body from left to right? And that's gotta be your transversus abdominus. Linea alba, of course, is a band of connected tissue right down the middle and very superficial. Bicep, biceps, deltoid, nice to know, I mean, not nice to know, must know. Now, if we look at the forearm, I, I, I won't ask you for specifics, especially on the forearm, but I'll ask you, on the palm side, they're all what? Flexor. So your flexor carpi radialis has to be the one near your thumb side. Your palmaris longus has to be the one that's, the long one that's connecting to your palm. Flexor carpi ulnaris, it goes, that's the one on uh, the, your palm side that will uh, flex on your 
um, ulnar bone side. Right? So think flexor on the palm side. N and uh, on the like dorsum or the back of your hand, you're going to have what? Extensors. Another view of your synergy muscle inflection, which is your brachia radialis. We went through this. This is nice to know. Nice to know. I'm not nice to know. What am I saying? This is must know. External, internal oblique, transversus abdominis, uh, rectus abdominis, and the linea alba. That will definitely come out. This is the items that we were talking about. Let's, uh, let's kindly look at the female anatomy on the right side, um, letter B. You could see that the anus and uh, the vagina are tubes. Well, the rectum is actually the tube, and the vagina is actually the tube. The orifice is the opening, and the anus is the external sphincter, which we already know we can control. Now, remember what we stated in lecture. You have baby. This will be compromised, uh, especially if you have many babies. So you'll have prolapse. This tube will, might come out, and uh, this tube might come out. So that's also, um, if you look at your medical terminology, we looked at the word hernia. And the suffix for the word hernia is called seal, C-E-L-E. -E. So culpo is your vaginal canal. So a culpo seal is when the vaginal canal uh, herniates or protrudes um, out of the uh, vaginal orifice. And that's not good because now the outside, and now the inside is on the outside and it's a point source for infection. Now your rectum is the tube that connects your anus to the outside world. I can also have a rectocele, and that's a herniation of uh, your rectum, and um, the tube could prolapse or pop out. You mentioned um, uh, the uh, muscles of the thigh. These are nice. Here's the side view, and if you look at the iliotibial band or iliotibial tract, which is uh, connects directly with your tensor uh, fasciae latte, latte, potato, potato, biceps femoris, and of course your gluteus maximus with the more um, superior gluteus medius just tucked in right under it, um, under your uh, hip. And again, these are very important in movement of your leg and walking. Other views, these are nice. These are very nice pictures. So let's get beyond those. So what happens? Well, now we're at the very end. What happens when you get older? Myoglin, ATP, creatine phosphate, they all decline. And they start in your 40s. And if you lead a sedentary lifestyle, it starts even earlier. Right? So again, I'm always a walking commercial. you got to work out because if you don't use it, you lose it. Connective tissue and adipose tissue cells replace some muscle tissue. So you get a lot of fat. Um, and because, you know, um, well, I, I don't want to go into details. Just know what will increase. Connective tissue and adipose tissue. What will decrease? Muscle. So you'll have, because when you get older, you are, like remember when we were kids, you play all day. Right? Uh, if I'm in the gym more than an hour, that's, I, I'm, I need a nap. That, that's, but remember when we were kids, like the second the sun was out, you're outside. And, um, and, and even when the sun went down, what, what are you doing? You're still running. Um, now, atrophy. If you look at that word, atrophy, A means no or not, trophy means growth. So what happens when you get really old and you don't use your muscles? Right? And remember I told you about my running partner? He goes, her muscle tone is remarkable for a woman in her 60s. Because what does she do all day? She uses them. And she, like me, is like, uh, she's also the one who started, um, because she, has a, she had an office job. I don't know, I think she works at home now. I can't, from, I can't remember. But office job or work from home, whatever, um, uh, you know that's why I stand up in class. So I can use my muscles, I can walk around. Because if you don't use it, you lose it and you'll have atrophy and that's not good. What happens, M muscle, muscle strength decreases, reflexes become slower. But what do you do if you keep on practicing those reflexes? A 
a classic example is what? Mike Tyson. You guys see Mike Tyson? He is still very scary. But is he as, is he, is, does he have the same muscle strength and speed that he did when he was, uh, when he was in his 20s? No, but you could also see what happens to a man or a woman or a human being who still trains, and he still definitely trains. And I don't know, Iron Mike will always be scary to me. Exercise help maintains this muscle mass and function and this muscle loss. So these are some nice uh, lifespan changes. And remember, typically everything decreases uh, in lifespan changes, but what increases? Connective tissue most and adipose tissue. And maybe later we'll talk about why that happens. Um, it's actually due to damage. So you damage your muscle more when you get older and um, it gets replaced with connective tissue or fibrous tissue as a protective function and adipose cells because adipose has glucose and it feeds the repair process in that area. All right, so maybe I could just say that uh, my dad bod and my dad gut is because I got a lot of muscle there when I was young and now it's being replaced with lovely connective tissue and lovely fat cells. With that being said, thank you very, thank you guys very much and look out for my chapter 10 video which I'm going to put out shortly. All right, have a good one. Bye.